And we have today, we're very fortunate to have today here Dr. Karine de Vergeron, who is Associate Director and Head of the Europe Programme at the Global Policy Institute. She is also an Associate Contributor to the Robert Schumann Foundation in Paris and Senior Fellow of the Federal Trust. She has contributed, of course, to Chatham House as well as to the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Assemblée Nationale. She has published widely. I won't go through the publications. Uh, they include the New Silk Roads, European Perspectives and Perceptions and Perspectives, and Contemporary Chinese Views of Europe. Uh, that was published with Chatham House and Contemporary Indian Views of Europe. So, uh, Dr. de Vergeron is extremely qualified to talk on the various aspects of this, what is quite a complicated structure. So, over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you very much to the uh, Institute of International and European Affairs for inviting me today um, and choosing this topic, which is uh, of great significance for EU-China relation and in particular also for the future uh, developments. There are three specific challenges that I would like to really highlight um, um, this, this morning uh, for, in terms of the challenges for, for Europe in the context as well of the French perspective. The first is China's current economic development and what this means actually for European economies. The second is France and Europe's strategy towards China in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative across Eurasia and the consequences of that for European uh, unity. And third are the consequences of those development for Europe as a pole of power globally and what this means also for the future of the EU-China partnership. So let me first start with the economic dimension um, and the fact that China has in fact become an increasingly important trading partner over recent years and not just for, for France but for the whole of the EU. Um, the EU is still China's largest trading partner of goods, it amounts to 14.8% of China's trade, uh, but it has also become China's primary source of import, 12.8%, well ahead of South Korea, which is standing at 95 and Japan, 8.5%. And at the same time, China now represents as well uh, one of the fastest growing ma market for European exports and accounts for 15.4% of uh, EU trade up from 10% in 2006. In other words, uh, it means that in relative term, uh, the importance of China to EU trade has grown very significantly over recent years and is almost on an equal footing um, right now. The deepening, in fact, of this economic relationship between China and the EU has been all along, uh, I would say, the very defining feature of the partnership and uh, it will continue to be so. Um, the two markets are trading on average 1.7 billion a day. Um, and I'm not going to be going into length about the question of the EU deficit with, with China. But uh, it's also notwithstanding the fact that the EU is also a major trade and investment partner with the whole of Asia beyond China. Moreover, if you look at the new Silk Road, um, some experts actually estimate that well beyond the impact on bilateral trade between China and the EU, it could cover a, a quarter of global GDP. So we'll, we're talking about uh, very significant levels of, of trade, uh, potentially, and the effect for the Sino-European partnership. These economic developments, as you may know, have been going also hand in hand with China's new emphasis uh, internally on generating major and sustained investments in various future-oriented sectors, um, and especially in automated industrial manufacturing processes, which are often referred to as the Industry 4.0 technology or the Made in China 2025 program. 
What the Chinese government is seeking to do here uh, is to heavily subsidize research, development, and investment through state support to achieve greater dominance in high-end technologies. This includes building expertise at production machinery, which also means that China is also taking aim directly at sectors which used to be core strength of the European economies. Uh, if you take, for example, and this is more concerning Germany, but an important component of the Sino-European trade, car and car parts amounted for 19% of the total German exports in goods <laughs> towards China, and machinery around 14% uh, only two years ago. At the same time, the trend is that an increasing number of European companies are also becoming more dependent on, on the Chinese market. Also, as China is seeking to go up the manufacturing value chain and massively accelerating the modernization of its industry, it uh, is also benefiting in the long run from a number of skills. I'm thinking about the American Chinese working in the Silicon Valley uh, in terms of potential of further innovation for the Chinese economy. The reason I'm saying this is because it will really be crucial for Europe to continue to also improve its own technological edge and be confident that it can continue to innovate where technology transfers with China have not yet <coughs> taken place. There is a growing appreciation in France but also across Europe that the balance of challenges and opportunity presented by China over recent years are, has clearly shifted. Um, in the last decade, China's economic power and political influence have grown with unprecedented scale and speed, reflecting China's ambition to become um, a leading global power. And although uh, you may be aware that the 2016 EU-China strategy is really the cornerstone of the bilateral engagement between uh, China and, and the EU, the latest EU strategic outlook, which was released in March, um, reflected in a, a real development in a way in which Europe is also looking at bilateral ties with China, taking in mind this wider economic context, which is very important also for the future of, of European economies. Um, here I would say that the EU, enga EU engagement is now based on a twofold approach, and it's also very much the French perspective. The first is that the EU should deepen clearly its engagement with China to promote common interest at a global and bilateral level, and there are a number of subjects that, that are to the benefits of both sides, but that it should also at the same time seek a more balanced and reciprocal conditions governing the economic relationship, and this is clearly also of great importance for the EU. Um, this is of paramount importance, especially in the context of what has been probably a more aggressive strategy from China in terms of increasing investments uh, within parts of Europe, and I'm thinking in particular about Central Europe, Eastern Europe, but also Southern Europe, and acquiring key stakes in IN technologies. For example, um, the takeover of KUKA, the robotics firm in Germany, going right to the heartlands of Germany's high hand technology in late 2016. I can also mention in terms of infrastructure investment, uh, the investment which was made in the 380 million um, uh, bridge in Croatia over the Adriatic Sea, or the highway going from Montenegro to Serbia, also partly funded by, by Chinese investment. And here I just want to make a quick parenthesis, but I remember working back, and you mentioned them in uh, 2007 and 2011, on two publications on, on Chinese views of Europe. One of them was, was Chatham House. And when considering this aspect of EU-China trade, and in particular in 2011, it was just a few years after the 2008 crisis, uh, the question of increasing investment within Europe was important and to the benefit of, of, of EU economies as well. But it was already clear at the time uh, for a number of European businesses based in China that one should not blame China for being clever, strategic about pursuing its rationale and its interest, but it was up to us, European, to actually more united into having a coordinated approach of our common interest 
uh, in particular in case of strategic takeovers uh, to limit foreign holdings, not just coming from China, but more generally also globally. And European businesses on the ground have, have actually been advocating for a long time what the um, EU uh, set itself to, to, to do and to allow the possibility of a screening of foreign investment on core technological and high value added European businesses to avoid unfair competition from state subsidized uh, companies. For example, uh, if you look in some sectors or industry in the chemical industry, it has now become almost impossible for any single European company to compete against a Chinese bid for takes over uh, for new business uh, ventures, new business partners, simply because the funding which is proposed is something that we cannot match. At the same time, it's also very important to note that there are developments within China um, and that the draft of China's new foreign investment law, which came out uh, just a few weeks ago, and it's a law which should be passed for Janu January 2020, so at uh, the beginning of next year, is proving to be in many ways accommodating to European concerns. And that's a very important development. Um, as China growth is slowing down with an estimated 6% in the third quarter of this year, um, it seems that improving the environment also for foreign businesses uh, is becoming of greater importance to ensure that foreign investment continues to flow in the country, also especially in the context of the US-China trade talks. What is clear to me is that China will really seek to avoid any risk in derailing its economy from its longer term goal, which is looking at 2040-2050, the 100 years anniversary of the creation of the People's Republic of China, um, 1949, where uh, actually by then a, a doubling or tripling of GDP per capita is sought to actually uh, reach the position of leading global economic power. It was also very interesting to see, if you look at the list of demands at the beginning of the trade talks you, you, you referred to uh, from the United States towards China, a number of those items were actually looking at the future of China, that is to say taking aims at the large states to subsidize effort in advanced technology for 2025, such as uh, energy vehicle and artificial intelligence. Now, this is also uh, of great importance for the EU, and there is here uh, a clear mutual interest between Europe and China to seek to come to an agreement soon on the Comprehensive Bilateral Investment Agreement, uh, with the hope that that might come to, to term next year under the, the German presidency. Now, the second challenge uh, I would like to, to talk about in the context of future EU-China ties and how France sees that <coughs> is China's broader geopolitical and geoeconomic aspiration uh, within the context of the Belt and Road Initiative and Eurasia. There are potentially here many opportunities actually for Europe in developing new infrastructure able to link the Eurasian continent in a way which could benefit European exports across Eurasia and towards China. This will, however, uh, I believe, require more, much more strategic and coordinated approach from our sides and management of the initiative to the benefit of both China and the EU. Um, China is actually seeking to redefine Eurasian trade uh, through its new geographical and continental project as a model of driving economic integration. And it's also, of course, clearly for China to be able to export its infrastructures and products with neighboring countries, because the idea is the cent economic center of gravity will be moving to the far west within China as well, reaching out to uh, Eurasian and ultimately European markets um, to increase commercial expansion uh, from, from a Chinese standpoint. I'd like to say that in that, the current volume it is not still as transformative as the narrative would like it to be. And if you look at uh, projected 500,000 containers uh, in volume only via the northern and the central uh, railway corridor, which is planned for 2020, you compare it to 22 million containers in terms of EU-China trade for 2014 alone, which was six years ago, and trade has increased a lot, you see that, that uh, the narrative is still actually in, in development. Uh, in terms of, of its trade um, uh, scale. But, of course, it has huge potential in the long run, 
and is already influencing a range of strategic interests. And I'm thinking here particularly about energy supplies, uh, especially across Central <coughs> Asia. So the French analysis on this is very clear. Um, if China controls the departing points of the road, um, Europeans should actually be much more aware of their strategic strength in comprehending the selling points, selling outlets, and also the fact that the roads also start in Europe from the other direction. The aim here is actually to seek to turn it into an opportunity for greater exports towards China and Eurasian market. And this is very much what is behind the um, EU-Asia connectivity strategy, which was launched last year, but much more needs to be done in that direction. There is clearly still concern about the Belt and Road Initiative um, potential to possibly erode unity uh, amongst European member states looking for Chinese investments. Um, this reflects also very different perceptions and analysis across the European member states, depending on the level of investment that China has already been making in those countries. Um, I won't go back to what you mentioned about Italy, but of course within Europe, and it is a challenge, there are different analyses and perceptions that each European member state is doing about the Belt and Road Initiative itself. Um, this is especially true with regard to Central and Eastern uh, Europe, which has been seen by China as one of the gateway uh, into European market. And um, I'll only mention, for example, the modernization of the Budapest and Belgrade railway line, which was agreed upon in 2015 with um, a loan, a uh, Chinese loan, which was covering more than 85% of the cost. Now, within the remit of uh, the, what we used to be called 16 plus 1 summit, which is now 17 plus 1 with Greece actually joining in earlier this year, other mechanisms for cooperation have been put in place um, within this um, context with the development of two permanent secretariats, one in Riga, one in Belgrade, to coordinate cooperation in transport and infrastructure developments. There was also a secretariat for maritime affairs for the 16 plus one um, uh, strategy, which was launched in Poland last year, and a range of centers across Central Europe dedicated to technology transfer have been put in place. Uh, I think what is very important here, the main concern for the EU, is to um, consider that important issue pertaining to trade matters uh, linked to standards, rules, norms, and practices could be actually dealt with outside of where the EU has ex exclusive competence, which is to say 16 plus 1 outside of the EU itself. And this is uh, an issue in terms of unity that we really need to address and make sure that this uh, unity of interest at EU level is not eroded in any kind of form. And this is very much the French perspective on the, the issue. There are still ongoing concerns uh, across uh, some European countries about avoiding any po political cost to European uh, unity of action. And I'll just refer quickly to uh, uh, 2017, when Hungary and Greece blocked EU statements on human rights towards China, which was actually the first time that the EU together failed to make a joint statement at the UN uh, Human Rights Council. There is also a relative importance of Chinese investment in the Balkans uh, developing with Chinese infrastructure loans and uh, sovereign guarantee reaching the level of one third of national GDP just in the case of Macedonia and increasing level of investment also in Serbia, not just for high speed railway line but also a 1.5 kilometer bridge over the Danube River and a number of other industrial projects taking place there. <coughs> So the ongoing challenge really for Europe uh, is the fact that these European attitudes con continue to be shaped uh, primarily by national views towards BRI, although of course a coordinated approach is uh, seeking to emerge. But here there is much more room for greater political coordination in Europe, including by seeking to further in more concrete terms what will be the EU Asia connectivity uh, strategy. Um, including in external market or third countries where joint project also with China within the remit of the Belt and Road Initiative could, could, could be further considered. 
I'd like to mention one example so in terms of promising opportunity prevailing in project channel jointly by the uh, Asian Investment um, in Infrastructure Investment Bank and the EBRD, which is the Trans Anatolian Natural Gas Pipeline, uh, which is jointly financed and which is going through uh, Turkey through uh, Southern Europe. Now, according to uh, European estimates, Asia, with roughly 60% of the world population, accounts for 35% of EU exports and 45% of all EU imports. So the challenge here is for us, both in terms of the long-term investment, but also in terms of trade, in the rule, standards and norms and practices needed to promote market access and the movement of goods, services, capital and people across borders along the connectivity project that we will be seeking to fund or develop and foster. And here France does share the view, uh, as does Germany as well, that the Silk Road's fully fledged success will be eventually determined by the ability to promote balanced cooperation as well as social, environmental, financial, anti-corruption norms and standards and the respect of intellectual property rights across the connectivity projects and developments infrastructure but also beyond that will be made. Um, and in this context, I think it's important to mention the non-material dimension also of the Belt and Road Initiative of the Silk Roads uh, which should be further explored, including digital infrastructure, people-to-people -people interactions and cultural exchange along the roads and especially between Europe and China. Um, this is a component uh, uh, which is also important to the bilateral Sino-European relationship. All these developments will be also particularly relevant for the EU given the constantly evolving nature of BRI. Actually, there is no clear definition of what the Pelton Road is. It's been evolving, changed names uh, over the, the past six years, uh, also since uh, its, its creation, since it was launched. And Europe will need to be able to adapt and adopt a quick, fast and flexible approach to developments also as they come in within the remit, within the remit of, of, of the Belt and Road Initiative. This is also true when you consider Europe's uh, wider role uh, in world affairs. Um, so the French President Emmanuel Macron recently advocated uh, in the wake of the G7 summit in Biarritz last August the possibility to forge a new relationship between Europe and Russia in the realms of defense, cybersecurity and strategic relationships, which will be coherent um, from a French perspective with Europe's own strategic interest towards ensuring stability in the region. The French analysis here underlines what it sees as Europe's long-term strategic interest in creating a new relationship with Russia as part of a new architecture based on trust and security in Europe in the wider context also of Eurasia and the new Silk Roads. This is of particular relevance for the EU um, with a view to develop also European norms and standards through connectivity, notably at a technical level and in particular with the emerging Eurasian Economic Union um, and seeking to avoid the risk of pushing Russia further away from Europe towards uh, the East on some of those issues. Now, um, and this will be my, my third point. Um, the French global perspective uh, within this framework is very much to emphasize the idea of uh, European sovereignty that was uh, called by, 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 by the French president. France, as you will know, has had long-standing relationship with China, uh, and not just because of the recognition by the General de Gaulle in 1964 of the People's Republic of China, which was uh, an extremely important moment for the bilateral relationship. Seen from Beijing and in the context of Brexit, um, France is actually expecting to be taking on a greater role um, in the development of European ties, although of course Germany remains uh, China's most important trading partner within the EU in economic terms. Now what the French President Emmanuel Macron uh, is seeking to do is to build what he calls a new Euro-Chinese partnership for the 21st century. Uh, one which is based in the economic field, as we have seen, on a more balanced, 
trade relation with a level playing field in both ways, and one which is also based on a greater unity of action and interest at European level across the range of EU-China cooperation to the benefits of both China and the EU. Uh, once again, it's not about criticizing um, Chinese or Chinese investors for being pragmatic and clever sometimes in, 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 in their, the opportunities they've seen or benefiting from divisions within Europe, which was clearly the case over recent years. Uh, it is about us to seek a much more coordinated approach at European level and greater consideration of European interest in its continental scale. Um, the French president has made a clear reference to the need for greater European unity uh, in his last in the conference to the ambassador last August. Um, the reason here is that France really sees herself as playing a decisive, decisive um, balancing role globally and together notably with, with Germany as taking responsibility for a much more systematic European approach, in particular with China. And one example uh, which you, you briefly referred to was the actually very unprecedented step to uh, invite Chancellor Merkel and President Juncker uh, for the bilateral visit of, of President Xi Jinping uh, in Paris last March, which, which used to be bilateral national uh, relationship. But uh, the French president decided also that he wanted to have a European approach uh, together uh, with, uh, with Germany and President Juncker and also with, with China, which was a, a po very positive development in that direction. There are at least um, three key priorities for, for France where this fully united uh, European uh, corporate cooperation agenda should uh, be fostered. First is the economic and trade uh, agenda towards a more balanced um, bilateral uh, trade relationship, as we already touched upon. But this should also require, in my view, uh, European countries to seek to reduce their dependency on exports in the longer run and stimulate domestic growth forces and investment, as well as strengthening of European innovation policies. Uh, China is actually now able to shape the global economy in a way that will increasingly require adjustments from our part. Um, this is true, for example, in the digital field, uh, where the Chinese company Huawei is already beginning to install 5G technologies and mobile technologies in, in Europe, which is the prerequisite for autonomous driving. Um, but European countries, France in particular, but more generally um, also Germany, should take this as a stimulus to strengthen Europe's economic competitive edge uh, rather than being distracted by political division inside and near <coughs> Europe at a time when China herself is extremely conscious of its own strategic vision, in particular for Eurasia. An economic continent is rising, uh, one which is already able to take over some parts of our economy uh, and parts where we actually used to be very good at. Um, so we should not really be complacent about that and take this as a real opportunity to improve our strength. The second priority um, within the French perspective is a multilateral agenda focused on climate change and biodiversity where China has, become, has really become an ally uh, in that direction and there is a lot that can be further explored in terms of bilateral um, cooperation. And third is uh, an Eurasian agenda which would enable a better convergence between the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and the European Connectivity Strategy. The challenge here, again, is really to ensure that European sovereignty and unity is fostered. But beyond all of, all of this, what is also at stake is really um, the future of Europe's role globally and that of European values, culture and civilization in a new multipolar world order that is rising and to avoid also bipolarization between the United States and China. The old certainties and I think in part the old diplomacy that had held the Western alliance for a long time no longer pertain and the better Europeans fully recognize this, the sooner they will be really able to forge for themselves 
a new role in this fast-changing <coughs> world order. The key question is really where European, whether European leader will have the necessary common purposes to look at that together for the, on this issue of strategic relevance to them. By 2050, just give a couple of numbers, but Europe will account for around 6% of the world population, 12% of the world economy against almost similar share for the United States and 16% for China. Though, of course, power is not only mer merely a question of economic strength, uh, nor only directed by the size of population. It is uh, also about political vision and the capacity to inspire economically, politically, and culturally. And I think this is also a very important component as both <coughs> China and Europe share the fact of being old civilization. And there is a great willingness from China and I think <coughs> from Europe to also engage and understand this um, deeper perspective uh, in terms of, 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 of looking at the bilateral relationship and, and more widely. This is very much where France is also actually seeking to take on a greater role for the future of EU-China ties and most importantly to further promote European unity. Thank you very much for your attention.